So many of us traveled to this Congress, probably most of us, and we all took trains or planes or, yeah, maybe somebody drove by car, but most took trains and planes. And have you guys ever wondered about the infrastructure of those travel booking systems? Even more interesting, have you ever thought how secure those systems are? Carsten Nohl and um, Nemanja Nikodjevic. Uh, yeah, Carsten has a really nice record of uh, security research. Um, he had talks about GSM protocols um, and last year he had his talk about payment system abuse, which was really interesting. Together with Nemanja, he will show us his research on travel booking systems. And probably we will find out how we can get home free. Please give a really, really warm welcome to Carsten and Nemanja. Thank you very much. Always feels great to be back. I just today noticed that the first time I was speaking at this conference is 10 years ago. Um, so 10 years of... <laughs> thank you. Ten years of looking at 10 different legacy systems and finding vulnerabilities in all of them so far. Um, a lot of them were around RFIDs or mobile protocols. This time we're looking at something completely different, travel booking systems and vulnerabilities in there. Um, relative to some of the other talks we have been giving, this will have less hacking in it, not because we lost our interest in hacking, but because much less hacking was actually needed to exploit <laughs> vulnerabilities here. So sorry for that if you expected a lot of hacking. There'll be a little bit. Uh, that's why Nemanja is here. Um, but a little bit less than usual. So we're talking about travel systems. And there are three main players um, or, or actors in the, in the commercial travel world. There are those people who provide traveling, uh, airlines and hotels. There's those people who help you book them, Expedia, websites like that, or traditional travel agencies. And then there's um, brokers who um, make sure that whatever is available can be booked through those agents. So um, those are really the backbone of travel systems, but you don't really think about them much, or at least I didn't before looking into this research. The systems are very useful as global systems. In fact, um, they're called global distribution systems, and that tells you how old they are. This is before the internet was there. They go back to the 80s and 70s, so there was only one system that deserved the name of a global distribution system of, in this case, data, and this, this was travel system. So it, it makes sense to have these systems because, of course, one seat on an airplane shouldn't be sold multiple times, so there needs to be a global inventory somewhere. Also, all airlines should be using um, just a few systems so that they can do co-chair agreements, for instance, so that, again, the same seats on, on a flight aren't uh, booked multiple times. And consequently, these booking systems, they maintain three types of information. Um, the first one you're probably most, uh, most um, aware of are the prices. Um, airlines will, will put their price lists into these systems for booking sites to fetch. They're called fares in, in the travel world. Um, the next important data item in there is availability. So not everything can be booked that has a price. There needs to be a seat available at a certain booking class. And finally, when somebody does find an available seat to a fare that they want to purchase, um, that is then converted into a reservation. So this is after the seat is taken. Right? And you may have seen uh, some of this information before on, on travel websites. Um, let me just show you the one that I like to use the most. Um, the, the ITA matrix has been bought by Google a few years ago, uh, so you can't actually book through here anymore, um, but they, they maintain the interface for whatever reason. Um, and so let's say you search for a flight to San Francisco from here at the end of the year. Um, this, like any other website, will, will give you plenty of options um, from the different airlines. 
Now, what's different in, uh, for, for this uh, website is that they give you a lot more details if, if you know where to click. Oops. Uh, so the cheapest flight, really cheap actually, 325 bucks to go to San Francisco for New Year's, um, a one-way trip. And what's, what I like in this website is the rules. So this is real data that is kept in one of these GDS systems. And this already looks like the, the 70s, right? Um, <laughs> This would usually be, be uh, shown on, on a terminal, maybe green font on black background, um, and somebody would read through here, and they would say, okay, so you wanna, uh, you, you wanna book for certain dates, okay, the dates match. Um, you wanna go on, Turk um, on uh, TAP, uh, Portugal Airlines, so okay, that matches, and you could also take a few other airlines, um, and then you have to, to meet certain other restrictions. Um, for instance, you can, you can uh, stop over here, um, so this flight goes through Lisbon. You can stay in Lisbon for up to 84 hours before flying on to the U.S. That'd be nice, right? Um, and then it has all these, these other rules in here. For instance, um, you cannot cancel this ticket, right? It's non-refundable, but you can change it for a fee, right? And this goes on and on and on, right? Um, for just a single fare, and there's, of course, tens of thousands of fares available. Um, now this, you may be surprised to hear, is the only form in which these fares are available. There isn't an XML, there isn't a web service. This is how the airlines publish them. And then a website like Expedia, they have to write a parser for it to be able to present uh, flight options to you, right? So um, you may have noticed if you try to change or cancel flights, they don't allow that through websites often. Expedia, for instance, doesn't. You have to call them. And if you call them, they say, give me a moment, I have to read through the fare rules, right? So in that case, they just didn't parse all this information, right? Um, so that's the first thing that's, um, that, that's uh, kept in these, or maintained in these, these large um, GDS, the booking systems, um, the fares. The other thing uh, is the availability. That's a little bit harder to access through public websites. Expert Flyer is probably your, um, the, uh, the, the best one to, to use. Um, and availability is important. If you actually wanted to fly to San Francisco now for New Year's, um, we looked at the fare rules. So this is um, booking class O. Um, this is always the first letter. And then if you look at the availability for booking class O, unfortunately it says C for closed, right? So they don't accept any more bookings. So just because there's a price available doesn't mean that anybody can actually book this flight, right? And again, somebody like Expedia would have to now um, combine all of these different pieces of information to present a list of flight options for you. So let's assume they did that and you did book something. Then the third data item is created in one of these GDS, um, and that's the passenger name record, PNR. And that looks something like this. Again, you know, just the same uh, 70s, 80s style, um, with lots of private information. Um, um, Ed Hasbrook, uh, he, is, uh, he is a privacy advocate in the US, um, probably the, the, the loudest uh, voice to, to ask for more privacy around travel booking, and he was kind enough to make this available on his website for all to see what, what information is kept. So contact information, of course, things like email. This one shows you again how old these systems are, so they don't have to add character, right? Um, this, is, this is using an, uh, a character set from punch cards. In a punch card, you had six possible punches per character, so everything here needs to be encoded with a six-bit character, and there's no space for add. Um, so all ancient stuff, but still a possible privacy hazard, right? You wouldn't want anybody to access um, this kind of information about yourself. The three main players um, who run GDSs, um, Amadeus, mostly in Europe, Sabre, mostly in the US, and then there's Galileo um, that merged with a few other things into Travelport. And Galileo isn't really so much used by airlines, but it's more used by uh, travel agencies. Um, and then often multiple of these systems, they're involved in a booking. So let's say you go through Expedia and you book an American Airlines flight. Um, that has to be, uh, that the PNR has to be kept in Amadeus as well as Sabre. So there's two copies here. Or let's say you go through a travel agency that's connected to Galileo and you book a flight that has both Lufthansa and Aeroflot segments, it would be kept in all three of them, right? So there's lots of redundancy depending on, on where, um, where, where your flight segments and booking agents come from, right? But um, 
sufficient to say there are three big companies who apparently hold on to the private information of all travelers. Hundreds of millions of records uh, for each of those systems. And we wanted to find out uh, whether they can sufficiently protect this information. And there's, of course, reasons to believe that they can't. This is very old technology, and it's unclear whether they ever did any major security upgrades. But at the same time, there's reasons to believe that they are very well secured, because this PNR data, this very information about travelers, that has been disputed between different governments for a long time, in particular the US government, and asking for more and more information since 9-11 in multiple ways, and uh, the EU governments, they say, no, you can't have more information than you absolutely need. So they, they agree politically that, uh, yes, the US can get information on those travelers going to the US, but only certain data fields, and have to delete them after a few years. So this was years of negotiation. And you'd imagine that the systems at the, at the forefront of this dispute, they'd be secure enough that, let's say, we couldn't access those same information um, that, that even the US government is supposed to not access, right? So we set out to, to answer these simple questions. Do these GDS, do they have normal, basic security, right? Do they um, constrain access? Do they authenticate users well? Do they protect through rate limiting from, from web attacks? Um, and do they lock to be able to detect any possible type of abuse, right? And we'll, we'll go through, through each of them to see where those systems stand. <clears throat> Let's start with access control. And this is just drawing from, from public sources. Uh, so again, Ed Hasbrook, this privacy advocate uh, in California, he has been um, the loudest voice here, saying there's, there's uh, overreach by a lot of players already um, accessing PNI information. So for instance, if you have a booking, let's say a flight booking, Anybody who works at this airline can access your information. But then if you add, let's say, a car reservation to the same booking, anybody who works at a car rental company can also access, let's say, the flight information. And any agent at the, at the uh, booking agency that you use uh, can access all of this information. And if you keep adding information, all of these people still have access to it. That's just how these systems grew over time, um, but that's the first indication to me um, that this was, certainly wasn't uh, built with modern security uh, in mind. Most concerningly, the, the, the people working at or for the GDS companies, they have access to everything, absolutely everything, including their support staff, as far as I understand. So these are external companies that help debug the system, and they have access to hundreds of millions of people's um, private information, right? Um, so way too many people have access to way too much information. For instance, if you did an online booking, your IP address is stored there basically forever, well, until the flight is over. But uh, any of these people can now access your IP address, your email address, phone number, and all of this, right? Um, so definitely that doesn't seem to be fine grad access control. But as I said earlier, this has been known for a long time and criticized a lot, um, not acted on though yet. How about authentication? Um, the picture is actually even worse for authentication. Um, and I want to distinguish two different cases here. I want to distinguish professionals accessing records, so people working at travel agencies and airlines. And uh, as a second case, I want to distinguish travelers accessing their own records, like when you check in online, for instance, you access your own record. Right? Um, professionals, the way they access it typically is that their agency is connected to one of these GDSs through basically one account. So an entire agency system, or at least an entire location, uses one account. So years ago, somebody typed in some username and password, and that has long been forgotten, because locally they use a different access management. Um, a few travel agencies were kind enough to help us in this research, and the access credentials uh, we, we saw them using, they're just terrible. For instance, for one of the big systems that I won't name, um, you need Asian ID so that you can get pretty easily, and then the password for the web service, so the modern way of accessing this is WS for web service, and the date on which the password was created, right? So, even if you have to brute force 20 years, right? How many possible dates does a single year have times 20? This is ridiculously low entropy for an account that's supposed to 
protect information of millions of people, if not more. Right? Um, now, this is the best authenticator that we've found in, in these systems. <laughs> Um, it gets worse with travelers accessing their own information because there they just simply forgot to give you a password, not even a terrible password like this, there just isn't one. Um, and what they use instead is the booking code, uh, PNR locator it's sometimes called, right? I'll, I'll call it booking code. It's a six digit code right? that you, when you check in online you need that code. Right? And you only need that code and your last name. So you would imagine that if they, they treat it as a password equivalent, then they would keep it secret like a password, right? Uh, only they don't, but rather print it on every piece that you get from, from the airline. For instance, on every piece of luggage, you have your last name and a six-digit code. On your boarding pass, um, it used to be there and then it disappeared. And then these barcodes showed up, right? So it's inside the barcode. If you decode the barcode, there's the PNR in there. Um, I, I raised it here because this is still for valid booking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you have this, these six-digit codes um, printed everywhere, and you can, you can just find them on pieces of, of scrap at the airport, right? Certainly these, uh, these tags you find all over, but also people throwing away their boarding passes when they're done. And this is supposed to be the only way of authenticating users. And we'll, we'll show you in a minute how, um, uh, what kind of abuse is possible through that. Um, but let's first think about where, where else you could be able to, to find these PNR codes. Could, could, could it get any worse than somebody printing your password on a piece of paper that you throw away at the end of your journey? Of course, the internet can make it worse, right? And what better technology than to worsen the security problem than Instagram? So on Instagram... <laughs> So you, you got all these bookings, and in fact, I think that was one guy here. You see, he actually erased the information, but for one who, who knows what's up, every, there's a hundred who don't, right? And this is really all the information you need. I saw a Lufthansa one just now. Where was that? Um, yeah. So here's a Lufthansa one. This, this is from today, from um, posted by Marky at Frankfurt, right? So this is really all you need to get somebody's. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Yeah, sure enough. So <laughs> Marky M on Instagram is apparently Marketa Motolova, and this is her booking reference. I, I was debating whether or not to show this, but you guys are going to do it anyway when I'm done with this show. <laughs> okay. So a, a flight today from Munich through Frankfurt and then on to Seattle. And let me point out one thing, thing here. Um, where did I see the ticket number? Um, just use mine. It's Android APKN. Mm -hmm. show. Oops. And then let me write down the password. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so what, what I wanted to point out is that this isn't even a Lufthansa ticket. So she, she, she checked in uh, with Lufthansa in Frankfurt. Um, 
but if you look at the um, the, the ticket number, 016, that's a United ticket. And, and it, it also includes flights on Alaska Airlines, for instance. So any of these airlines have full access to this, this, uh, PNR, uh, and many of them will, will just grant people access to it, uh, if they know the PNR and the last name. And as Nemanja will show in a minute, um, even if they don't know that yet. Um, so, um, to, to recap for the moment, um, airlines give you a six-digit password that they print on, on all kinds of pieces of paper and that you will post on, on uh, Instagram, right? And wh why shouldn't you? Everybody else does too, apparently, 75,000 people at least over the last couple of weeks. Um, so the, the authentication model here is, is severely broken too. Um, and what kind of abuse arises from this? Of course, you can now use this PNR, uh, log in on Lufthansa, as I've just done, or a more generic website, um, like check my trip, and look up people's uh, contact information at the very least. So there's always an email address in there. Uh, there's usually a phone number in there. If in Lufthansa you click on, I want to um, change my booking, uh, probably will ask you for your payment information and pre-fill the postal address for that. So you get somebody's postal address that they used for the booking. Um, passport information, visa information. If you travel to the US, as she does, there's definitely passport information in the PNR. All of this information is now readily accessible. Right? Um, now, so far, there was zero hacking involved. Right? Um, that's why we have Nemanja here. We'll show you some, some actual um, hacking uh, to get even deeper into these systems. Can we switch the screen? Yeah. So, uh, when... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, when we started this research, uh, we needed to find uh, lots of uh, these uh, booking numbers to see if there is some relation between them. So uh, luckily we didn't have to, uh, to make any bookings that we had to pay. So because there are websites like this one where you can just uh, make a booking and pay it later, but you get a booking reference number at the time. So let's make some very normal German name. <laughs> booking for someone from Germany. Actually they have, they check the, the phone number so it has to follow the certain form, let's find the Germany. Uh, so yeah, from Berlin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> and then Hans at San Diego.com, something. As you can see, I tried quite some <laughs> of these. So for this one, we already got our booking reference number which is Y56HOY. And this one, in a minute. Okay, we have to wait a bit. Y5LCF4. So if you notice, they are very close to each other. So they both start with Y5, which uh, means that they were booked on the same day. Probably because the, uh, one is on Lufthansa, the other one is on Air Berlin. There is slight difference, but uh, so they are not exactly sequential, but we can say that they are, they are concentrated in certain range for a certain day. So what we can do now is that we can go to uh, one of uh, our servers. But first we have to check if check my trip works because I had some issues with the network. Let's, ooh. <laughs> okay, so this is a bit unexpected. So, uh, so we will have to skip this part where we actually look for uh, for Carmen San Diego in one of our bookings. But uh, yeah, well, this is a side effect of responsible disclosure, right? So you yeah. tell a company that on this day you will do that and that um, thing to that website, and it just either blocked the IP ranges here or just took down the website, which they have done a few few times before, right? Um, but so what what you can do is say again. Actually, uh huh. Actually, uh, I, I think the whole website is is turned but off. What we can demonstrate, I think, is that if we go with uh, this booking number to Air Berlin website 
and then type last name Miller. And actually, because it's six bit encoding, it has to be UE, no mouths allowed. Mm -hmm. So, select all the food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> security. So, let's see. Find so what the, the, the part of the demo that you didn't show is just brute forcing these ranges, right? If you yeah. know uh, which ranges are used in a day, you can try them all, or at least we did many times. And so that would then, uh, in theory, uh, give, you, um, give you access to all of this, or not just in theory, in practice, unless they take down their, their entire website, which they knew we were going to use <laughs> for this demo. But, um, uh yeah, but on this, for example, uh, this example, if we caught that flight that we wanted to to, to, right. to catch, the Mrs. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll show it later. Um, yeah. But at least the first win for, for, for privacy, no information is leaked through this website for the rest of this talk, at least. Um, <laughs> can we switch back to, to the other screen? Um, so... One thing that you would have noticed had this not just been a flight reservation, but an actual ticket to ticket, it would have given you options to rebook it, to add a frequent flyer number, all of that good stuff. So uh, what's the abuse potential here? So far we've only talked about privacy intrusion, right? And privacy intrusion is bad enough. Imagine somebody snapping a picture of your luggage. That person has your email address and your phone number right there, right then, right? So. But the abuse potential goes uh, much beyond that. Um, for instance, you can fly for free. Um, you can fly for free using different methods. You can find somebody else's booking and just change the date. Um, the ticket, um, in fact, we, we can show it a little bit later, that, that we had prepared for this demo, um, that, that we're going to find through, through a little bit of brute force. That's a flexible ticket, so you can just change the date, you can change the email address, um, you just take that flight yourself, unless the airline checks, um, compares the ticket and, and, and your passport. Uh, oftentimes they do it visually, right? What they'll do is they'll send you a PDF, you change the name, you take it anyway. Um, but at least in Schengen, in, in the EU, people don't even do that. Um, but let's say you wanted a ticket in your name. Um, you can... Uh, depending on the airline, um, call them up or even use their website uh, to cancel the ticket and then issue, uh, issue a refund to you inside the PNR and then use the money that's freed up there to book a new ticket. Right? Um, some airlines also give you um, MCOs, miscellaneous charges orders. The Americans will, will know this very well. Every time you get bumped from a flight, they give you an MCO. Sorry, uh, we can fly you uh, home today. You'll have to go tomorrow. But here's $1,000 towards a new ticket, right? It's, it's real airline cash. And those same MCOs you can issue based on flight cancellation. So you cancel somebody else's ticket and you get airline money to, to book your own ticket. And again, there are no passwords involved. The only authenticator is this six-digit sequence that people post on Instagram, print on their boarding passes, and that Nemanja um, should be able to brute force um, on their websites. Um, what else can you do once you have somebody's PNR? You can change or add um, a mile number, right? And some tickets are really, really attractive for, for mile collection. Um, take a round trip to Australia in first class. Uh, that's 60,000 miles right there for one round trip, for one PNR. Um, and that will get you a sweet uh, free flight to somewhere nice um, or uh, even, um, even some, some um, vouchers for, for online and offline shopping. Um, one website that I wish we're still working uh, is, of course, this one, right? <laughs> um, but they, they shut down business, apparently, um, unrelated to this talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you have access to somebody's PNR. Um, you can not just um, stalk them, but change their flights, or uh, which, which may tr tr trigger some, some curiosity, right? That flight can't be taken twice, but you can very stealthily add your mile number everywhere, well, a new not mile number um, matching that name um, to collect those sweet miles, right? Um, now, are all airlines affected by that? So the, the <laughs> demo that we didn't get to show um, brute force for one last name, San Diego, right? Um, all the PNRs for a day, 
um, and it quickly found, in fact, a bunch of records. There's not just one San Diego uh, flying that day. Um, but in some airlines, they're a little bit smarter. For instance, American Airlines, the largest airline in the world, they don't just want the last name, but also the first name. And if, if, you, if you're interested in one specific person, let's say Carmen San Diego, you would still find that person. But if you want to conduct fraud, this, this becomes a little bit more tricky, right? Um, a fraudster would just pick a random, uh, very popular last name and brute force PNRs there. Um, and that becomes more difficult if also you have to, to guess um, a first name. However, even American Airlines, um, those records can be accessed through other websites. For instance, ViewTrip is another generic website, so like this infamous Check My Trip that just went offline. Um, and ViewTrip uh, allows you to brute force by just last name and PNR again, right? Um, so there's multiple ways to access the same information, some of which are, are more secure than others, and of course only the weakest link uh, matters. So, um, in fact, ViewTrip, what they will say is um, they found a record and they can't give you access to the information, um, but then Tripcase will, which again takes only last name and reservation number, and they will tell you the first name also that then you can type into the American Airlines website again right? to change the booking, let's say. Um, so that there's all these, these, these different ways to access uh, a person's um, information here, and everybody is slightly different. So let's look at the entire universe of, of travel websites, starting with the three big travel providers. Um, each of them uh, uses six-digit um, booking code, but they use these six digits uh, rather differently. Sabre, for instance, um, they don't use any numbers, which of course uh, severely impacts the, 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 the uh, entropy, um, but then others, for instance, Amadeus, uh, they don't use one and zero, because that could be confused with I and O, and then Galileo drops a few other um, characters. So uh, at the end of the day, none of them really use the entropy of even a six-digit passcode. Um, so all of them are in entropy lower than a randomly chosen five-digit password. And we will never recommend anybody to use a five-digit password, right? So this is strictly worse. And what makes it even worse, at least for privacy intruding attacks, is the sequential nature of these bookings, right? You saw the two that, that Nemanja just now generated. Um, both of them were, were from the same very small subset. So if you just wanted to know all the bookings that a person did today, you can brute force this in 10 minutes uh, with, with a few computers running in parallel. It's not so easy on Sabre because they seem to be chosen more randomly. Uh, however, Sabre has the lowest entropy, so if you just randomly want to find bookings for popular last names, Sabre is, is uh, your, your system of choice, right? So they're all weak, um, but uh, the, the weaknesses uh, differ in, in shades of gray um, for this privacy intruding and for the, uh, for the financial fraud type attacks. Um, as one example, though, of how easy it is to find these booking codes, um, if you look up a thousand just randomly chosen uh, booking codes in Sabre for the last name Thmis, five will come back with current bookings, right? So half a percent of the entire namespace is filled with current bookings for people called Smith. Now add in all the other last names, their namespace must be pretty damn full, and it's only 300 million records if you calculate entropy, so it looks like almost every record is used up, um, and they're running out of space, they'll have to fix this anyway at some point, but that of course makes it all the easier to randomly find and abuse other people's bookings. So each of those providers uh, runs a website um, that allows you to access all the PNRs in the system, if you know the PNR and the last name. And uh, one German reporter writing about this, he calls, uh, he calls him the website that you didn't know existed, that you have no use for, but that anyway uh, put your privacy at risk. Right? So there doesn't seem to be any upside to these websites. I certainly don't need to use them, um, but they're there and they're bad. Because when we did the research, none of them had any protection from brute forcing, meaning we could try hundreds of thousands, even millions of different combinations, PNR and last name, um, and those websites wouldn't complain even a bit. 
Now, we, uh, we did expose Amadeus to, to uh, way more queries than, than the others, and at some point they did notice, maybe also because some reporters just asked him for comments on the research, and they have tried to, to improve. Um, so the, the classic .checkmytrip.com website, that was just killed a few days ago. Rest in peace. Thank you. It's gone. 50% uh, of the problem solved. Uh, but the other website that was still around up until literally half an hour ago, um, what they did over the last couple of days was they added a capture. Um, but the capture gave you a cookie, and the cookie you could again use for indefinite number of, of queries. Uh, this is a company that just hasn't done web security before, right? Um, but then they also limited the number of requests per IP address, right? Um, now, we, we do this from Amazon, so it's not so difficult to, to spawn new, new IP addresses, but still, it, it severely slows us down. About 1,000 um, uh, uh, requests per IP address. Now, even if they now took down Check My Trip for good, of course, this is not the only pass to a reservation. As we've seen before, you can just use um, the, the provider's website directly. And the popular ones in Germany, um, they, they differed in security quite a bit when we checked a few weeks ago. So Lufthansa itself differed on their different properties. Um, the standard website asked for a capture, not the first time, but I think starting from three requests. So really good compromise. They, they, they make it comfortable to use for really anybody who just wants to look at their own records, but then they make it a little bit more painful for somebody who tries to, to look up too many. But then a mobile version, for instance, didn't have that capture, right? And again, weakest link principle applies. Um, Air Berlin, they, they had some rough IP filter. Again, a thousand requests per IP, that's still a little bit too much. They introduced a capture today, right? So again, in response to this. So this is already uh, showing some effect. Um, so thank you to Check My Trip and Evelyn for working on this over the holidays. Much appreciated. Um, maybe if you know anybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, on, on the other GDSs, um, the situation is, is uh, much worse still. Um, so they're still as brute forcible as they ever were, um, as are the websites, right? Um, except for the, the little bit of uh, first name, uh, extra complication on American Airlines, really every, every website we have tried is uh, not protected from brute forcing. And uh, this is surprising to me. I mean, I've uh, in, in, my, in my consulting work, I've, I've never seen a website where not the first pen tester ever uh, looking at it would say, oh, you didn't have rate limiting in it, please add it, and then two days later, they had. Um, so for most of this industry, that is yet to happen. So uh, no cookie here either. Um, let's talk about one more abuse scenario. That's... Um, I consider very relevant, but that's maybe because in, in my consulting life, I've been dealing with human security um, for the last couple of years, um, appreciating that technology is mostly not the weakest link, but uh, the gullibility of, of people working at a company. And the same probably goes for travelers. So imagine a scenario where you made a booking just a few minutes ago, and now that airline, or at least it looks like that airline, sends you an email saying, thank you for making this reservation. Here's all your booking uh, uh, stuff summarized for you. Please uh, update your credit card information, though. The, the booking didn't go through, right? I would click on that. I, I expect them to email me. Um, I, I know that sometimes credit cards are, are fuzzy. I would click on it and enter my credit card information again, right? And how is this possible? Of course, we can stay ahead of, of the, the current pointer in these sequen sequences and find bookings that were made in the last, let's say, half an hour, right? For popular last names again. And each of those uh, bookings will point us to an email address and give us all the context we need to include in this very, very targeted phishing. So if nothing else, I think this should convince um, the, the airline industry to close these loopholes because the evilness of the internet will, will not ignore this forever, right? Fishers are always looking for new targets and this would be a very juicy one. Um, all right, so we looked at, um, we looked at the three big GDS 
uh, now. Uh, there's a few other players, for instance, CETA. Uh, it looks like on the way out, um, but these two very big airlines, they still use it, so they're certainly still relevant. So they are even worse. They use, instead of a six-digit booking code, they use five digits. And one digits, a digit is fixed per airline. So if you know you're looking for air in there, you don't even have to brute force that, leaving just four digits to go through um, and to, to brute force. Um, now, we don't have a demo for this because we, we found three other more fun ones to demo. Um, so <laughs> um, the mania will all now show you uh, Ryanair, Oman Air, and Pakistan International Airlines. Um, note that, that all of these are connected to, to big GDS systems, so um, it's now the websites that make it even worse than we already discussed before. Uh, and can we switch over to the other computer again? Thanks. Yeah, I guess many people fly with Ryanair here. So uh, they use Navitair, which is now owned by uh, Amadeus, so they don't share the same address space. But uh, on Ryanair website, you can either search for the reservation with the email address and the reservation number, or the last four digits of the credit card that you used for booking. So, <laughs> again, great authenticator, right? Yeah. 10,000 options. So, as they don't have CAPTCHA, we can have a look uh, for, oh, it's a bit slow. Uh, okay, so we know that uh, the last four digits of uh, Carmen San Diego's card are these. Well, and, and if not, we can just try all 10,000. We can just try, yeah, we right? can do the other way around. So, yeah. but this way we know that, uh, and that it starts with these characters and let's try to brute force it. In the meantime, let's have a look at the Oman Air. <laughs> so they ask for the booking reference and for the departure airport, but departure airport doesn't have to be just the departure airport, but it can also be any airport that is within the reservation. So for Oman Air, we think that it's Muscat, which is the capital, yeah. so usually <laughs> most of these flights go through there. So let's see if we can find someone who is and is now just trying random, random yeah. uh, booking codes that are valid exactly. within that namespace, right? So again, they don't really use the full entropy, so that makes the search a little bit quicker, but other than that, it's just a pure brute force. Yeah, and as there is no capture, as you can see, we can move on to the next one. So this one is the winner. So basically, <laughs> they, they, they trust you that it's you. So. And let's see, okay, so we already have one for the Oman Air. Ooh, okay. So uh, this is the one, uh, this is where, um, I don't know. Okay. That was Ryanair, huh? Yeah. This is the Ryanair, yeah. Okay, ooh, so we didn't print this, these two characters, uh, but, so because we wanted to hide it, if we accidentally hit some booking with that card number, <laughs> we don't want to show the, the, the booking reference number of someone else, so it might be even, <laughs> So the people here, yeah. Okay, so uh, we can try uh, then. Oh, okay, we even got one from the Pakistan. So uh, Carmen San Diego is flying from Schönefeld to Timisoara, and here we can just enter the what was the I think if I'm right. Let's see if this will work. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So, hello, Carmen San Diego. So, so now, now we know where Carmen San Diego yeah. is, finally. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, the point has been made. You can brute force these websites rather easily, and you don't really trigger any, any, any alerts, apparently. Uh, which, uh, again, coming from an, an IT security background, I find uh, pretty shocking. Right? Can we switch back to, to the other screen? Um, so um, let's look at the, the last security feature that um, we would expect um, any IT system to have these days, especially knowing that it has been criticized for lack of IT security for a long time. And that, of course, is accountability, logging, right? At least track who's 
legitimately or illegitimately accessing these records. It turns out uh, that it ha has been asked for a long time by different people, again, most notably Ed Hasbrook, this privacy advocate, um, but also uh, others, uh, other reporters and, and other advocates have come across this for years, saying, uh, there's rumors that, let's say, the Department of Homeland Security in the US, they have root access in these um, GDSs. Um, where are the records, whether they are accessing it or not? Where are the records for abuse by, by support staff in these GDS companies? Uh, where are any records? And the, uh, the GDS companies have always said, oh, we can't keep any records. It's not technologically possible, right? I call BS on that. Um, they are logging in the tiniest minutia, any change to a reservation, there's a log for that. But an access log does not exist and is not technologically possible. I think there's a completely different reason behind here. If, in fact, these companies gave access, um, unlawful access, or at least in violation of privacy uh, laws in, let's say, the EU or Canada, if, in fact, they gave that access to other governments, the last thing you you want is a trail of evidence showing that people have access records, right? So this, this has nothing to do with technological restrictions. This is purely those companies don't want to be in the middle of a debate where probably some sealed order in the US makes them disclose all this information, but laws in Europe make them not disclose the information. They just don't want to have evidence either way, right? But that leaves us in a very peculiar position where now we know that these systems are insecure, use very bad authenticators, expose this over websites that can be brute forced, and don't keep any record of if that actually happens. Right? So it's completely unknown uh, how much abuse may be happening here. I think we can be pretty certain that the flight changes for people to fly for free, that they are not happening very frequently, because that's the only one of these uh, these attack methods that would leave very clear evidence, somebody actually complaining, saying, I wanted to go uh, take my flight, but apparently somebody else already took it before me or canceled it and took off with the money, right? But the other cases, we have no idea whether or not they're happening. They're technologically possible, and nobody seems to be looking for these abuse patterns, right? Um, so, in summary, there's just three big global databases, two in the US, uh, one in Europe, um, that keep all the information on all the travelers. Um, this information includes your personal contact information, uh, payment information, uh, your IP address, so lots of stuff that in a lot of other systems we consider uh, sensitive, private even, and it should be protected with a good password. We would advise people to use an eight character or longer password with special character. None of that exists here. The passwords here are six digits. They are less than five digits worth of entropy. They're printed on scraps of paper that you throw away. They're found on Instagram, and they're brute forcible through numerous websites by the GDS companies and through the travel providers. So this is very, very far away from even weak internet security. This really predates the internet and and stupidity and, and insecurity, right? And while there's multiple scenarios in which either privacy of users is at risk or even fraud could happen, none of this is being locked and nobody knows or has any way of knowing the magnitude to which these systems are already abused. So what do we need here? Um, we uh, clearly need more limitations on who can access what. This is not just my ask, this has been asked for 10, 20 years, um, but more on a technical level, in the long term, we need passwords for every traveler. You should be able to post a picture of your boarding pass on Instagram without having to worry about somebody abusing it. This is a piece of paper that you will throw away. There should be nothing secret about it. Right? If you want to share it, feel free to. Somebody else needs to add a password to make that safe again. Right? But that's a very long-term goal. These travel companies, they're so interwoven, as we saw today, um, that 
all of them really have to move at the same time, right? The GDSs have to do their share, um, but then each of the of interconnected airlines has to do their share. We saw this one random ticket from, from Instagram. So this was a Lufthansa ticket with some um, Alaska Air components issued by United, right? So at least those three companies have to work together. And how many more different airlines do they have co-chair agreements with? So we're talking about hundreds of companies who have to come together and decide we want to introduce passcodes, passwords, whatever you want to call them, uh, for each booking. So that is a, a long-term goal. In the short term, though, at the very least we can expect is for all these websites that do give access to travelers' private information to do the bare minimum of web security, at the very least some rate limiting. Don't allow us to, to throw millions of requests at your properties and, and give us back uh, honest answers, right? That is unheard of anywhere else in the cloud, um, but for travel systems who, who claim for themselves to be the first cloud ever, this seems to be very standard, right? And then finally, until all of this can be guaranteed, until there's passwords, and until uh, there is good rate limiting. I think we have a right to know who accesses our records, and there must be some accountability, especially knowing how insecure these systems are today. But this is a, a long way, and, and I can only hope that, that we are starting a journey by, uh, by, by annoying large companies like Amadeus. They have done their little bit of, of, of fixing over the weekend now. Um, so hopefully some others will, will follow suit and we will have better system. Until then, of course, I can only encourage all of you to, to, to look at more of these travel systems because there's plenty more to find. We're only scratching the surface here. And more generally, to look at more legacy systems. I think we're spending way too much time making some already really good crypto just a tiny bit better, or finding a really good mobile operating system, the next little jailbreak that will be fixed two days later anyhow, ignoring all these huge security issues that have been there for many, many years in systems that are a little bit less sexy and riddled with bug bounties uh, than something else that we do spend a lot of time on. So I hope I, I could encourage you um, to do that. Um, I want to just hand out a few thank yous to, to uh, members of, of our team uh, with, without whom this, this research wouldn't have been possible and to a few uh, industry experts who, who were kind enough to, to uh, read over these slides and, and provide feedback and help us uh, hopefully not have any major gaps on, uh, on our information. Um, and then to you for showing up in, in such great numbers. Thank you very much. Wow, great talk. Thank you very much. We have uh, five minutes for Q&A, so uh, please line up on the microphones and we'll take some questions. First one. Do you have any indication of how secure the systems are on the other end, that the airlines supply their fares into the entire system? So uh, is there any indica indication that those uh, systems might be more secure than on the customer side, or would it be easy to inject uh, a cheap fare, for example, by impersonating the airline with... Uh, we passwords. Um, honestly, we don't know. Um, it, it was definitely on our list to, to research, but we, we don't have time for everything, so we, we focus more on the, on the customer privacy. Um, but one thing that, that I really would want to test if I had any way of doing it, imagine the parsers for, for these strings, right? Um, imagine injecting some special characters in that, right? Um, <laughs> so, I don't know who creates these strings, and uh, I really, maybe I don't want to know, but if anybody does, then you could play with some SQL commands. I, I think um, a lot of websites would, would wake up understanding that on that front, uh, they don't do enough security either. Okay, question from uh, the Signal Angel. A question from IRC. Recently, US Customs and Border Patrol started collecting social media identifiers for foreign citizens trying to, en trying to enter the US on a visitor visa. Could that information be accessible through PNRs? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't think it would be. Um, one, one, so, I, I, so yes, they are. Yes, they are. They the are in the PNR? Yes, yes. Okay. 
<laughs> so okay. I, I would have imagined that it's, that it's more a case like um, this, uh, this journalist, Cyrus Favia, um, he requested through Freedom of Information uh, Act disclosure uh, all the records that the US government kept on his traveling, and he found a lot more stuff than just in the PNR. Um, they had notes in there like, oh, he's a journalist, we had to search him extra for that, stuff like that. So they don't want to write that into the PNR, but the government keeps separate records that may be indexed by PNR, I don't know. Okay, microphone here. Can you, can you say something about how long information will be stored in those uh, travel systems and whether uh, your users have a right to get them deleted? That's, that's a good question. I think that that differs by, uh, by system. So in Amadeus, records are removed pretty quickly, um, days or, or at most weeks after the, f the last flight is finally done. Um, but in Sabre, I had the impression that much older records were still in there, which may explain why the data set is so dense if you keep accumulating all the information. But at the end of the day, this is all going back to mainframe technology. So I don't think anybody understands these algorithms anymore. They just kind of work. <laughs> the deletion? The deletion, yeah. I don't think you can request anything to be deleted. I, I don't think they consider you a person that they want to talk to, right? They are, you are not the customer. Thanks. Okay, the microphone there and the behind. Yeah, so it seems that the uh, immediate way to abuse these systems, like you said, with uh, abusing money and uh, the mileage and so on, it seems that those paths are actually somehow monitored by airlines. So if I'm collecting miles on tickets not under my name, that would raise some flags. Do you think that's not the case? Um, y yes, I, sh I should have ha been more explicit how, how this attack works, the, the mile diversion. So of course, you have to have an account in the same name as the person flying. So had this demo worked, you would now have a PNR for a lady Carmen San Diego. You can just go to Miles and More and create an account under that name. A lot of airlines, though, they also allow you to change your name, right? So you just change it. Whenever you found a, a round trip uh, Australia ticket, you change the name to whatever that target name is. And I know for a fact that people are doing that right now, not you guys, before even, right? Uh, based on Instagram photos, right? So people are diverting miles by creating new accounts or by keep changing the, the names of their accounts. And yes, airlines do sometimes notice this, but only when it becomes excessive, right? And yeah, sure, um, that's their money. I just hope that it will become so excessive that it's such a big problem that it can't be ignored anymore. And then the privacy issues get fixed in, on the same token where privacy is never enough to convince a big company. But if you throw in a little bit of fraud, it may be enough. Okay, one last question, A microphone here. Hi, Karsten. Um, when people use like GDSs, they have this really archaic TT, not, they're not even, they're like actual terminals, not even pseudo mm -hmm. terminals. And then they expose like these APIs for, so you could write your code in like Java or whatever. I'm wondering if there's research to be done at that level, um, or you, did you just not look at that, or that's just an area of further um, research? We did quite a bit, uh, but we found no way of, of making that public in any way that wouldn't require a login from a travel agency and all of that good stuff, right? Um, so I think the, the most I want to say about that is the logins that travel agencies have, they are terribly secured, but of course, I can't encourage anybody to go out and hack them. But if you did and you had access, um, you would be logging into something that really looks like a terminal and you'd be typing some commands and the next thing you know, it throws a Java stack trace at you, right? So these just look yeah, like that. terminals. They have moved well beyond that while still maintaining this look and feel of a mainframe and they're terribly insecure. So these stack traces, they just come left and right, even if you try to do the right thing, right? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we have one question from the internet. Um, somebody wants to know, uh, how do you avoid DDoSing those services when you just brute force the, passenger, uh, the booking numbers? Uh, yeah, good question. Of course, we, we don't want to hurt anybody, so we, we try to, to, to keep the rates uh, low. And uh, turns out if you throw 20 Amazon instances at them, they don't go down yet. And, uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Karsten and Netanya.